Reaction being the yo 487. Jack and that neighborhood. My brothers and sisters. Another Saturday, another time to go back to this man right here. And that man is AJ from the Y Files. The Y Files Saturdays, y'all. This is that time of the week when we get to let out our inner geek. And the title of the video is our alien overlords how we secretly serve the tall whites now I'm, i've said it before y'all and i'm just gonna say it again there is a possibility that aliens are controlling earth as a whole you know what i'm saying humanity as a whole like there may be an alien society or group or whatever from a planet galaxy freaking millions and billions and trillions of miles away but they may be it's just a possibility that they literally have a button that they could press at any point in time and just destroy Earth. You know what I'm saying? The only reason that we are here is because they are allowing us to be here. There's that possibility, my brothers and sisters. I'm just saying. And before I go on a whole tangent about it, I'm just going to shut the elf up so we can get into the video. But before we get into the video, my brothers and sisters, y'all know what y'all got to do. Get whatever you may need. Get what you need, please. We back to AJ from the Wi-Fi house. Y'all got what y'all need. Y'all ready to go? Then let's and go. The hair on the back of the cook's neck stood up. It felt like he was being watched. He turned around. Nothing. It was Nellis Air Force Base in the middle of the night. The mess hall was empty. All the men were asleep in the barracks. The only people awake were him and a couple of guards at the front gate. The only reason he was up was to grab a little extra chow. One of the perks of being a cook, you get the keys to the kitchen. Mm. Then he heard rustling. He turned and something flashed in the corner of his eye, something small and white, and it moved fast. A door quietly squealed open. Then he heard steps running into the desert. He caught glimpses of something white darting through the brush. He thought it was too big to be a rat, but maybe a coyote? He wasn't sure. Whatever it was, he didn't want it rooting around his kitchen. He picked up a rock and threw it toward the noise. Then he heard a whimper. As he reached his arm back for another throw, he felt a hot pain shoot through his body. He dropped the rock. He was paralyzed by pain and by fear. Then he heard a woman's voice from inside his own mind. She said, stop or die. The pain dissipated. As soon as he could move, he bolted back inside the kitchen. He locked the door behind him, terrified. He had no idea where the voice came from, but he knew one thing for sure. It wasn't human. Get whatever you may need. Did you meet the extraterrestrials or merely see them? Oh, I met them many times as I described in my book. Um, although I never went looking for them, they were always happy to come looking for me. It was March 1965 when Charles Hall arrived at Nellis Air Force Base in the Nevada desert. He was fresh out of basic and excited to see his new post. When the Air Force tested Charles, he showed an aptitude for math and science. After graduating top of his class, he thought he could choose his own post but he was specifically sent to Nellis. Area 51. Well, Area 51 is officially a detachment of Edwards Air Force Base, but yes, it's in the same area. Mm. Charles was trained as a weather observer. 
His job was to travel around the base taking readings. Most men would be bored to tears with this assignment, but Charles didn't mind. He'd get his own truck, extra pay, no officers breathing down his neck, and he liked the quiet of the desert. If he needed to blow off some steam, Las Vegas was close by. Plus, Charles had a friend on base. His buddy Dwight recommended him for the job. Charles was grateful for the opportunity. That night after he settled in, Charles and Dwight got to talking. They chatted about the base, how bad the food was, which officers were good guys, which ones to avoid, typical soldier talk. Then suddenly, Dwight got very serious. Look, Charlie, summer's coming. You have to keep your eye out for Range 4 Harry. Old Harry likes it hot. He hides in the mountains during the winter. But once it warms up, he comes down to Indian Springs. He likes to run around on the dry lake bed up on Range 4. When you're up there, be careful. Range for Harry? Charles had no idea what Dwight was talking about. He asked if this was some hermit who hid in the mountains. Yeah, you would be crazy enough to run around a nuclear bombing range. Well, that's what Charles thought. Dwight frowned and shook his head. Then he told Charlie the story of Range for Harry. I bet this story about to be crazy as elf, but I would be, if I was freaking Charlie, I'd be sitting back like, bro, what the are you talking about, man? Even after hearing the story. So let's hear how crazy it's going to be. Back in 54, there was an atomic bomb test over at Frenchman Flats. Harry is a horse who came too close to the blast. Not close enough to be vaporized, but close enough that something happened to him. Now, he gives off a white glow. If you see him, do not approach Range 4 Harry and don't look at his face. He's not like a normal horse. Officers say he's more human-like with large blue eyes and a long white tail. Okay, I would have been stopped him in the middle of telling this story about Range 4 Harry. I wouldn't even let him get to the end, bro. You just told me about a freaking horse that looked more human-like than a horse and it went from being brown or black to white. Like, dude, this is some spooky-ass shit, but at the same time, I think it's made up. Like, you gotta be kidding me, bro. What is this freaking folk tale that you telling me about, bro? What is this something that we sit around the campfire and you just tell this crazy-ass story? Or are you for real? Do you really believe in this horse that looked like a human? Because I need to know, are we playing or are we not? Let's go. Charles stared at Dwight for a long moment, then exploded into laughter. He expected some kind of hazing at his new post, and he figured range for Harry was supposed to spook the new guy, but he wasn't falling for it. I'm serious, Charlie. While you're at range four, don't take any risks. The last guy who got too close to Harry was John Zimmerman. I don't want you to end up like him. Charles laughed and promised to be careful. Still, he wasn't buying any of this nonsense. The next day, Charles was in the infirmary's waiting room. He needed a routine physical before going out into the field. The nurse on duty caught him chuckling to himself. She asked what was so funny. Charles recounted Dwayne's range for Harry story and the fate of John Zimmerman. The nurse's face dropped. She said, I'll be right back. Charles heard her opening and closing a metal cabinet. When she returned, she said, I'm not supposed to show you this, but since you're going to range four, you need to know what's out there. It was Zimmerman's medical folder. Inside mm. were four pictures. Each of them showed a man covered in horrible radiation burns. Zimmerman said a white horse came out of the North Range and charged him, but that was all he could remember. He somehow dragged himself back to Indian Springs, where an officer found him barely alive and in absolute agony. Charles's stomach sank. It wasn't a joke. Range for Harry was real. And this why I be getting scared in the motherfucker, man. I be like, damn, so the story is true. You know what I'm saying? After you get some evidence in your hand, and this is exactly how my eyes would be. Big than the motherfucker looking at that shit like, what the hell? This shit actually happened to Zimmerman? Zimmerman? Now nah, I'll be thinking about questioning even freaking taking this job. I, I might go AWOL for real. I might go AWOL, y'all, and get the hell up out of there. Charles finally met Sullivan, the man he'd be replacing. Sully was friendly, funny, and likable. The two men hit it off right away. Sully took Charles on a tour of a few weather shacks out in the ranges. One of the shacks was locked, so they couldn't access the equipment to take their readings. 
Sully told Charles to just write down any numbers. Yeah, government precision. Mm -hmm. Well, Charles reminded Sully that they only checked out three weather shacks. There were still four more, range one, two, three, and four. Sully's demeanor changed immediately. He said he'd take Charles to the other weather stations, all except range four. When they got to range one, Sully wouldn't leave the truck. He was terrified. He told Charles if he wanted to check out the weather shack, he'd have to go on his own. Sully said he'd keep a lookout, and if he saw anything, he'd go back to base for help. He told Charles, if you hear me leave, lock yourself in the shack and wait. I'll come back for you. Ah, uh, yeah, I don't like this plan. Me either. Well, Charles asked if Sully was talking about range for Harry, and Sullivan snapped at him and said there's no such thing. But Sully would not get out of the Jeep. He wouldn't even take his hands off the wheel. He was squeezing the steering wheel so tightly that his knuckles were white. This was not the same man Charles met just a few hours earlier. When Charles got to the weather shack, he checked the equipment and logbook. Nobody had been there for months. Sully had been secretly going off base and faking the numbers. He mm. never stepped foot in those weather shacks. Oh, wow. nobody noticed the guy kept disappearing. Ah, right. Government precision. Hmm. When Charles returned to the Jeep, he confirmed that Sully had been lying about the numbers. Sullivan didn't care. He said he'd give Charles a tour and never wanted to go to the ranges again. Pretty soon. I'm saying though, Sully, what the hell is, why you can't tell me what the hell is scaring you so bad? What got you so freaking scared so you don't even want to get out the Jeep, man? You know what I'm saying? Can you in, in, inform me on what the freak is going on so I can know what type of danger I'm in? Because clearly you feel like your life in danger right now, Sully. Let me know what the hell are we in? Are we in some boo-boo? <laughs> Shit, are we in that S-H-I-T right now? Let me know. Soon, Charles would understand why. Over the next few months, Charles spent more time on the ranges at Indian Springs than anyone else. Against advice, he was usually out there alone, but he enjoyed it. It was peaceful, and he never saw a range for Harry. One day, Charles was out on the range, and it was especially hot. In the desert, the ground could reach 120 or 130 degrees, and today it felt even hotter than that. Charles spent most of the day in the weather shack. He didn't have air conditioning, but he had an old fan, and that was good enough. Besides, the sun was setting, and soon it would go from blistering hot to freezing cold. That was life in the desert. Feet up on the desk, Charles daydreamed as he gazed into the desert, watching the sky go from deep blue to orange to red. There was no sound except the songs of meadowlarks. Charles wondered to himself if meadowlarks were common in the desert. He didn't think so, but whatever birds they were, he enjoyed the sound. Then he saw something dart between the sagebrush. Charles blinked. There it was again. He assumed it was a large rabbit or a coyote, but it was covered in brilliant white fur. The more he focused, the more he realized it was moving erratically through the maze of sagebrush like it was in distress. Charles jumped out of his chair and threw open the door of the shack. Then he saw it. It wasn't a rabbit or a coyote. It was a child. What the freak? A child? I've described them. I know we have an animated picture of uh, what they look like on the website. Kind of describe the tall whites for us. Well, the one that Paula has on her website is a very good rendition of a particular tall white lady. Um, each one of them are individuals, like the people, say, in New York City. But they were generally, th throughout much of their adult life, they were about the same height as me, 5'11", 6 feet. Mm -hmm. They were very thin and frail. They had skin as white as a piece of paper. The, the, what I do know about them is that they come from a planet that's somewhat hotter than the Earth and somewhat larger than the Earth, and they spend and they naturally live underground. It's just so crazy hearing a dude talk about these freaking aliens like he really had encounters with them and know a little bit about them. But it's also at the same time hard to freaking believe. Like he he just like when uh what the name of the other dude was who was telling Charlie the story about Harry. He like, dude, how in the hell you want me to believe this ish? You know what I'm saying, man? It's just unbelievable. But it's crazy, though, at the same time. And it is possible. I always say that, my brothers and sisters, anything is possible. Let's go. 
The girl was barely three feet tall and her skin was chalk white. She wore a silver jumpsuit and boots and her hair was brilliant white blonde. Behind her bright blue eyes, she looked as terrified as Charles. She was tangled in the brush. He called out to her. He said there's no reason to be afraid. He wasn't going to hurt her. He cleared the sagebrush around her so she could easily get out, but he made himself clear that he wouldn't touch her. On a nearby fence post, he left a canteen of water. He said if she was lost, he would help her. All she had to do is ask. Charles turned back toward the shack. That's when he heard something crashing through the brush. It was big and it was moving fast and it was getting closer. Charles turned and saw something, a man, a very tall man. He had the same features as the little girl, pale skin, white hair, silver suit, and he was charging right at Charles. The sounds of the metal larks now became screeches. The peaceful desert had become chaos. Charles jumped back in the weather shack and barricaded the door. Did he just see range for Harry? Charles wasn't sure, but he was sure that these people weren't human. Charles waited for what felt like hours. It was the middle of the night and the desert was pitch black. The songbirds and the screeching had finally stopped. The only sound was a gentle rustling of wind through the brush. Charles gathered his nerves and left the shack. He checked his canteen. It was half empty. In the sand, he saw three sets of footprints, a child and two adults. Someone was there. Charles had seen enough. He scrambled to his Jeep, fired up the engine and tore down the dirt road heading back to base. No more than a few minutes passed when Charles got another shock. Standing in the brush next to the road was an extremely tall woman, well over six feet tall. And like the child and the other entity, she had skin as white as chalk. Her hair was shimmering silver. She seemed to glow in the dark. I mean, at this point, if I was charged, y'all, I think I'm going freaking crazy out here, man. I think I'm still asleep. Like, this is a nightmare, man. Like, this cannot be real. I keep freaking encountering freaking aliens man like in my red like this is real life i would be i don't i don't know what the fuck i would be doing y'all but i know i'll be trying to get the fuck up out of there that's crazy to think about like it's not not like he just had one encounter he had that encounter then a little while later now he's seeing another fucking alien on the road while he trying to get away from the previous aliens man i'll just start to freak the fuck out y'all let's go charles felt panic welling up when a feeling of calm suddenly washed over him. As he passed the tall woman, he could hear her in his mind. Telepathically, she thanked him for helping her daughter. Again, Charles felt his fear rising, but once again, there was calm. The woman, if that's what she was, was radiating peaceful energy and gratitude. Charles felt like he couldn't be afraid even if he tried. Charles hit the gas but checked his mirrors. After a few minutes, the woman disappeared, and with her went the feeling of peace and calm. Charles stopped his Jeep, stumbled out, and threw up. He was shaking and out of breath. Once he had his wind back, he vomited again. He didn't realize it then, but Charles had won the trust of one of the tall whites. At least that's what the US government called them. The tall whites were not from Earth. The truth was, Charles wasn't sent to the ranges at Indian Springs by his commanding officers, nor was he recommended for the job by his friend Dwight. Charles was specially chosen by a committee of high-ranking generals, members of the government, and leaders of the Tall Whites. Throughout mm. his time at Nellis, Charles was never told the full truth about his work. He was never given any classified briefings or documentation. He was never read into any black ops or secret government programs. Charles was just a weather observer. But the truth was, he was the one being observed. Wow. 
That's crazy, man. He he literally got sent out there on a whole complete like mission or experiment or whatever may have you than what he actually thought it was. He thought he was actually going out there to be a weatherman. Come to find out you went out here for them little freaking experiment on you, bro, in a way. You know what I'm saying? As far as your interactions with the tall whites and stuff. But I want to say something about the tall whites real quick. What if that lady on the side of the road would have told you, like, thank you for saving or helping my daughter? How could you even respond to that shit other than be like, you're welcome, like real timid, like, and then just try to ride off. Okay, I said you're welcome. We all good, but please, alien lady, get the fuck away from me, please. That's how I would be in that situation, man. It's getting good, y'all. It's getting good. Late one night in 1896, Colonel H.G. Shaw was traveling in horse and buggy near Lodi, California. Suddenly, the horse became frightened and stopped. In the middle of the road were three seven-foot-tall beings. The colonel described their skin as so white it looked like polished ivory. Looking up, we beheld three strange beings. They resembled humans in many respects, but still, they were not like anything I had ever seen. They were nearly or quite seven feet high and very slender. They were possessed of a strange and indescribable beauty. Colonel Shaw said they didn't speak, but they made warbling sounds like birds. You can actually find this whole story online. It made the front page of the Stockton Evening Mail on November 25th, 1896. This is the first modern report of the tall white aliens, but their story on Earth goes back millennia. Mm. Paul Hellyer, the Canadian defense minister, was one of the first high-ranking government officials to acknowledge the alien presence. He became interested after a squadron of UFOs was mistaken to be Soviet aircraft. An investigation was launched into this whole subject and uh, a document was prepared which uh, concluded that at least four species had been visiting Earth for thousands of years. You're probably familiar with a few of these species. There are a few variations of the greys, which are described as being under four feet tall with large heads and large black eyes. There's a species called the Nordics, which are very human-like. There are the tall whites and a few others. Other species that I learned about uh, not too long ago were called the tall whites. For years, it was rumored that at least one or perhaps more than one race of aliens made a deal with the United States government in early 1954. The defense minister agrees. There are live ETs on Earth at this present time and um, at least two of them probably working with the United States government. Wow. Nobody. That man coming out with uh, some hell of a statements to make in front of that, uh, that crowd. You know what I'm saying, man? He making some hell of a statements. Knows the specifics of the arrangement. Yeah, the shadow government knows. Well, yeah, they do, but the public doesn't. The best guess is that the U.S. would allow the aliens to build facilities on Earth without disruption. The U.S. would also allow aliens to abduct American citizens as long as they provided the government with the list of abductees. In exchange, the United States would have access to alien technology. The U.S. wanted anti-gravity and propulsion technology. The aliens would not give them this. They felt that humans were too violent and dangerous to be let out of our cage, which is this planet. Hmm. However, the U.S. did receive help with other technology. The first of which was titanium. Now, titanium was discovered in 1791, but it wasn't until the 1950s that titanium began to be used for military aviation, specifically in high-performance jets, starting with the F-100 Super Sabres and Lockheed A-12s. The Super Sabre, by the way, is the first jet to break the sound barrier. If you think this craft looks like a stealth bomber, that's not by accident. 
the U.S. Air Force used a lot of alien technology to build stealth aircraft. Transistors are said to be alien tech. Transistors allowed the size of electronic devices to be made much smaller and lighter. Laser technology arrived in 1958. That same year, we got fiber optics. And also in 1958, we got the big one, the microchip. The following year, the first integrated circuit was developed. Now, skeptics dismiss these claims as coincidence, and I understand that. But consider this. In 1947, ENIAC was built. This was the first programmable electronic digital computer. It weighed 30 tons. It contained 18,000 vacuum tubes, 70,000 resistors, 10,000 capacitors, and 5 million hand solder joints. It took up an entire room. ENIAC Dang. was decommissioned in 1958 because all of that 30 tons of technology could now be placed on a single chip. That's cr that's crazy, y'all. That's crazy how it went from that how it went from that mic macro of a thing to that micro of a thing. All that technology that was in that room is literally in a chip now, and it only happened in like ten years. I mean, I know it all uh, technology advances, but damn, did it advance that fast, or did we get it from the freaking aliens? I'm just asking the question. I'm just saying quite a leap in tech in under 10 years. Exactly. Satellites, wireless tech, unmanned aerial vehicles, even night vision. All this technology has allegedly been gifted to or reverse engineered by the United States military. Well, certain parts of the military. Mm. When Charles Hall gained the trust of the tall whites, they showed him some of this technology. They even let him see one of their scout ships. Actually, you've seen them too. We did. We have. Did they tell you, Charles, where they were from? What star system they might have come up from? Well, one night I was there with a the teacher, and, and I asked her where she came from. And she um, smiled and said, asked me, do I know the names of the stars that the tall whites use? And I said, no, I didn't. And she said, so why do you want to know where we come from? However, one night they were standing around me, and I mentioned the star Arcturus, and they all got real nervous. Mm. Charles formed a friendship with the tall white woman whose child he helped find. She went by the name The Teacher. Charles later met Range 4 Harry, who is definitely not a radioactive horse. Range 4 Harry is a high-ranking tall white alien. The tall whites travel the stars in large, black, triangular titanium ships. Smaller scout crafts were used to travel within the solar system and around the Earth. These are roughly the size of a bus and can only land on Earth during the full moon. You've seen these scout crafts before. You just know them as the Tic Tac. Charles learned that the scout crafts aren't alien at all. Government contractors like Boeing and Lockheed are the ones building them. Let's look at this. You know what this is. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the ASA. My gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. Look at that thing, dude. This is... We have all seen that image before, well, that video clip before, my brothers and sisters, if you one of these ones who enter this alien type of ish like me. And it's still, like, so freaking, like, that is not a regular airplane or a helicopter, man. Did y'all see the way that thing was moving through the sky? It's an alternative energy and propulsion device. These are things that have existed all the way back to the 60s. But the one that they call the Tic Tac here off the coast of San Diego, the white one, looked very much like this. These have been made by the Lockheed Skunk Works. Skunk Works is Lockheed Martin's advanced development program. It works on highly classified research as well as exotic aircraft platforms. Because of their deal with the U.S. government, most military personnel believe the tall whites use Earth as a truck stop in the middle of the solar system. Earth is rich in raw materials and has these smart little apes who can make somewhat decent vehicles. 
Through conversations during his two-year post at Nellis, Charles learned the Tall Whites oversaw the development of a lot of human tech, but they've never taught us how to reach light speed or how to create the anti-gravity elements of their ships. Now, if you saw last week's episode on free energy and anti-gravity, you remember that anti-gravitic technology was very popular in the early 1950s. The entire aerospace industry was talking about it. Then suddenly, nobody was talking about it. The suspicion mm -hmm. is the US military had help in getting this tech to work, so they classified everything. Sometimes the tall whites would take high-ranking military members on tours of the solar system. American generals wanted to expand humanity's operations to other planets. But the tall whites don't think we're ready yet. But Charles does think there's significant trade happening between the US and the tall whites. And when they feel we're ready, the tall whites will finally allow us to inhabit other worlds. So what did they want with someone like Charles? If these beings already had a working relationship with the US government, why was Charles suddenly part of the equation? Well, the answer concerns the other part of the arrangement with the tall whites. Charles learned he was part of an experiment. He was being studied by the tall whites, especially by the teacher. He was fascinating to their species, and the teacher enjoyed spending time with Charles. Yeah, I think of all the education that I missed, but then my homework was never quite like this. Do 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 Pebblefish. The teacher taught Charles about her people, and he taught her about humans. Charles spent so much time with her that he became known as the teacher's pet. Get it bad, get it bad, get it bad. Yeah, I'm half a teacher. The tall what? Get it bad, so bad. I'm half a teacher. Yeah, I'm just trying to liven things up. Go, go ahead. The tall whites can speak English, but their natural voices are far higher and lower in range than humans. Their natural speech has been compared to songbirds. While tall whites may appear somewhat human, their abilities are quite different from ours. They possess the power to project powerful emotions into the human consciousness. They can also sense the emotional state of the humans they encounter. Now, even though the tall whites are naturally peaceful, they are always armed. They carry a pen-like object that can stun, damage, or even kill. Ew, it sounds like a sonic screwdriver. Kinda, yeah. But Charles was never in danger. He developed a deeply emotional relationship with the Tall Whites. Not much is known about Tall White biology. We know they age slowly. Their first stage of growth lasts until age 400. At this point, they stand between 6 and 7 feet tall. Then they go through a second growth stage. They can grow up to 8 or 9 feet tall, and their eyes turn from blue to pink. The average lifespan of a Tall White is about 800 years. Charles was never... Just think about that part, man. The, the fact that these mother can live up to 800 years, my brothers and sisters. Hey, hey, all I'm saying, man, is I do believe that it's aliens out there. Their lifespans is completely different than ours. You know what I'm saying? But wow, can you imagine that? What if we had the ability to live for 800 years? I don't even know if I would want to live for 800 years. 800 years is a long freaking time, man. I don't know, but just the thought of that is just like, whoa. Told where their home planet was. He felt they intentionally kept this a secret. However, when Charles mentioned the star Arcturus, they became uncomfortable. Arcturus is in the constellation of Buotis. Booties. Buotis. It says booties on the teleprompter. It's pronounced Buotis. Whatever. The Black Knight satellite is uh, supposed to be from booties. Buotis. But you're right, that star system has come up before. Now, despite being a more advanced species, tall whites secretly fear humans' intuitive capabilities and ESP. They believe it's just a matter of time before the human race evolves the ability to tap into these powers. They believe we'll develop abilities like telepathy and telekinesis, which is moving objects with thought. They believe every human has the ability to project their consciousness to any place on Earth or beyond. Remote viewing! Right. Remote viewing researchers have said that every human has this ability, but only a few talented people have been able to tap into it. 
I will say this real quick, y'all. I do feel like us as humans as a whole, like, we got some innate abilities that we have not unlocked yet. Like, I don't know if it's telekinesis or tele telepathically, whatever that, telepathy or whatever, man. But I just feel like it's something that humans, and it may be a thousand years from now, we make it to a thousand years from now, that we finally figure out how to do. I feel like it's something inside of all of us that we haven't figured out how to unlock it yet but i do feel like if the earth lasts long enough one day it will be unlocked ingo swan pat price and joe mcmonagle were talented remote viewers who worked for military intelligence and pat price was killed because of it don't forget that's the theory remote viewing links below yeah we have a lot of episodes on that subject well, in total, Charles's experience with the Tall Whites lasted just two years, from 1965 to 1967. In 67, he was deployed to Vietnam and he never saw the Tall Whites again. He waited almost 40 years to tell his story, but when he finally did, other witnesses came forward who had seen the Tall Whites. There was enough first-hand accounts that researchers started looking for evidence. The first step was to try to find the secret facilities built by the United States government. And somebody found them. Mm. But my question is, why did you wait 40 years to tell this story? You know what I'm saying, man? Like, dude, why would you wait freaking 40 years? That part right there just make it that much more unbelievable that this story is real. I, I couldn't wait 40 hours to tell somebody about these freaking tall whites. If I was in his shoes... When Charles Hall wanted to release his book, Millennial Hospitality in 2002, no publisher would take it on. And that was a mistake. He self-published and the book was a hit. Two more books followed and Charles made the typical rounds, UFO conventions, book signings. He did a few TV interviews. He even appeared on Coast to Coast with George Norrie in 2005. Uh, when you work with aliens, I think you're legally required to go on Coast to Coast. Well, if you want to sell books, hmm. that's the show to do. Now, all this attention brought out skeptics who wanted to prove Charles wrong. And it brought out the believers determined to prove him right. And the more people that looked into Charles' story, the more of the story was confirmed to be true. Charles was at Nellis Air Force Base when he said he was. He was a weather observer. He was deployed to Vietnam in 67. All those facts are easily checked. I want to hear about aliens. I'm getting to them. Get there faster. Some of the best research I found was done by David Hilton. David's website is long gone, but it used to say he was a historian, anthropologist, and researcher. Now on David's YouTube channel, he has a few videos that seem to confirm that Charles Hall was telling the truth. I had an interest in the story of Charles Hall and the Tall Whites for a number of years. After reading his book, Millennial Hospitality, I was trying to locate the positioning of the weather stations on the bombing and gunnery ranges that he talks about in his book so that I could better understand the orientation of the various locations. When researching the story, David came across this photo. At the bottom is Creech Air Force Base in Indian Springs. Remember, even though Charles was stationed at Nellis, his work was done out here at the ranges in and north of Indian Springs. The photo shows range one in the southeast, range three just north of the base, and range four in the valley. Oh, that's Harry's hood. Right, that's where Range 4 Harry got his nickname. But what mm. caught David's attention were the areas marked Scoutcraft Hangar, Scoutcraft Parking, and Resting and Play Area. Charles talks about these locations in his books, so David opened Google Earth to see what was out there. Now, before we zoom in, remember how Charles described the tall white Scoutcrafts. They were about the size of a bus, white and elliptical. In David's video, he shows this image. That looks like the Tic Tac UFO we've all seen by now. But here's the thing. David released his video 11 years ago, long before the Tic Tac was made public. Dr. Stephen Greer and others claim the Tic Tac is a UFO made by Skunk Works at Lockheed Martin. Now, Charles Hall doesn't specifically name Lockheed, but he does say that the scout craft are made by military contractors. Now, let's see what David finds on Google Earth. What? There is some kind of platform, and near the platform, three elliptical white objects, each about the size of a bus. Tic Tacs! They certainly look like it. 
And even if they're not alien scout craft... They totally are. Fine. But even if they're not, look at the location. There are no roads or even walking paths leading to this place. And this is exactly where Charles said the craft would be. He also said there was a recreation area here. That platform could be what he's talking about. To a white shoot noops? Could be. So David and people in his audience started scouring Google Earth around the old bombing ranges. Oh, did they find more uh, alien playgrounds? Yep, lots more. Wow. One of the first sites listed on the video is just off the end of the runway at Creech Air Force Base. This seems to agree with Charles Hall's story of the aliens coming onto the base from the northwest corner at the end of the runway. In total, David was able to find 18 separate sites. Other people found a few more. I included some coordinates in the description if you want to check them out for yourself. Now, some I'm just saying, man, all this can't just be a coincidence. All these different sites spread out all over the place. I don't know now, y'all. Everything can't be a coincidence, man. The locations David shows have been scrubbed by Google Earth. Predictable. But his video is from 2013, so we can see the locations before they were erased. Most of them are man-made structures, but with no apparent access. Yeah, because you access them from underground. That is the theory. Hmm. But building a tunnel system of this size underneath the bombing range would be an enormous undertaking and extremely expensive. If such a project did indeed occur, you'd expect there to be evidence. There's evidence, isn't there? Yup. Yahtzee! Not only is there evidence of a major construction project, there's evidence of a black budget cover-up. Yahtzee. Yahtzee. To build an underground base with miles and miles of tunnels, it's gonna be a huge undertaking and wildly expensive. But there's evidence that this project did happen. In January 1951, an article was published in the Las Vegas Review Journal, and the headline is Indian Springs Project Key to Defense Plans. The project is said to cost $300 million, and that's in 1951. In today's money, that would be $3.6 billion. For comparison, that's about what it cost to build a Freedom Tower in New York. The article said most of the money was to build housing and offices. Look at the base. Do you see billions of dollars worth of construction anywhere? No. I don't. So where'd the money go? Again, the credit goes to David Hilton for tracking down this information. According to the article, the contract was awarded to the McKee Construction Company in El Paso, Texas. Government contracts are public information. So let's look at the records the McKee Construction Company has for this job. Job number 1267. Description, alternate test site facilities. Location, Las Vegas, Nevada. Contract started on December 23rd, 1950 and ended May 23rd, 1951. Total contract cost, $680,000. Ah, uh, my what math the? isn't my strong suit, but uh... But about 299 of that $300 million is missing. Black budget! It looks that way, but we don't know for sure. Even the article from 1951 says, quote, the actual details of the program are cloaked in a security blackout. When Las Vegas residents learned about the huge construction project, locals contacted the base looking for work. They were told the military would be using no outside labor for this project, but that 300 million went somewhere. If we don't see that money spent above ground, there's only one other place it could be. Underground? Yep. Holy sh That's crazy, man. And, that, and, and, and I don't know if this is true, and we have watched other uh, videos from AJ about stuff being built underground. All I'm going to say is that I do believe that the government do got something underground. Somewhere they got something going on that they ain't told us about. Maybe it's in Area 51. You know what I'm saying, man? It's somewhere out there in the United States, my brothers and sisters, where they got some stuff going on below our feet. Let's go. Charles Hall and the Tall Whites is considered one of the most credible stories about aliens living with and working with humans here on Earth. But is it true? Well, like many of these stories, we have no physical evidence. We only have the word of the author, in this case, Charles. Do you believe him? 
not really. Well, most of today's story comes from Charles's books and the documentary Walking with the Tall Whites, both linked below. When Charles tells the story, he sounds sincere, but I've heard many stories from people who sound sincere and turned out to be frauds, and I've outed a few of them on this channel. Now, I don't have evidence that Charles Hall is a fraud, but parts of his story do bother me. First, he released his books, and there are six of them now, as science fiction. Only later did he say these things really happened. Now, supporters of the story will mention three other witnesses who were with Charles at Nellis Air Force Base. They say his story is true. But those witnesses didn't give their names. They're only known mm. as witnesses A, B, and C. And to complicate matters, on January 13th, 2014, Forbes published an article with a strange headline. Iran says tall white space aliens control America. The article wow. says the United States is ruled by a species of tall white aliens who made a deal with President Eisenhower in 1954. The article also says the tall whites helped bring the Nazis to power in the 1930s. Apparently, this information was discovered by Edward Snowden. Wait, 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 wait. So, so this is real? Uh, no. Hmm. Forbes was covering a story first reported by the FARS news agency, operated by the Iranian government. Forbes said the article is most likely Russian disinformation designed by the FSB, Russian intelligence. Oh, the American media sure loves to publish Russian disinformation, don't they? They sure do. Now, I don't believe anything that comes from the Iranian or Russian media. Oh, but you trust American media? No. Yeah, the boy. But what if they accidentally got something right? That the United States is being controlled by what the article calls a secret regime. I don't know if Charles Hall is telling the truth. I don't know if the tall whites exist. It's up to you to decide. But the secret regime, the shadow government, I do believe that exists. And I'm far from the only one. And the cabal com And I believe they exist too, goddammit. Comprises members of the three sisters. The Council on Foreign Relations. The Bilderbergers and the Trilateral Commission. Elected by no one. The International Banking Cartel. The oil cartel, members of various intelligence organizations, and select members of the military unit, who together have become a shadow government of not only the United States, but of much of the Western world. The plan is well advanced. Thank you so much for hanging out. I'm with AJ O'Neill with my brothers and sisters. I do believe that there is, and I, I'm not going to use the Illuminati. I'm not saying Illuminati. I'm just saying there is some type of secrecy of the government at the very, 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 very top. Like the, the most hierarchy of the hierarchy. You know what I'm saying? The very top of it, y'all. There is a group of somebody that somebody's that got some stuff going on that we don't know nothing about now are they in contact with aliens do they know about aliens i'm pretty sure they know about them but have are them and aliens friends or do they have they signed agreements with aliens and all that and be in contact with aliens on a daily basis or weekly or yearly i don't know about all that yeah my brothers and sisters but it is a possibility but um I, like I said, man, I do agree with AJ at the end of the day that it is a freaking, I'll just say secret society, even though I hate using those words, but it, that's the only thing I can say so y'all can understand what the hell I'm talking about. That is hiding stuff from us. But I digress, man. This was just a great video from AJ off the top. And I will say this. I don't believe Charles. I don't believe his story. It was a great story. It was a nice trip to go on, to go to Fantasyland and try to believe some of this stuff with the tall whites and all that, all that. The crazy thing is about those locations, though. Like, I mean, at some point, man, what, it was like 18 of them found? Like, dude, at some point, this is not a coincidence. It's something. Now, if it, it is it what uh, we think it is, I don't know. You know what I'm I'm saying is it what we perceiving it to be or is it something else that they got going on i don't know it could just be that and also i do feel like uh the government is building some stuff underground man somewhere out there my brothers so somewhere out there 
But I digress for real now. I just said I digress, and then I kept going on again, man. I'm going to go and let y'all go now, my brothers and sisters. I appreciate y'all coming back. As always, y'all just please, 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 please hit that like button, comment, subscribe, and do all that if you ain't did that yet. And you know you got to come back tomorrow because we're going back to the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Ballin'. But until then, my friends, I also need you to remember this. Love, peace, and happiness. Stay safe. Don't stop. Keep going. Yeah.